in Capitol Hill. Um, 78% of Americans support more tax spending to pay for transit. Um, and it was a study done by, well, the usual suspects. And then later on in the article explains that the, uh, the source for that uh, tax money to be paid on transit is, uh, is, uh, yeah. Doesn't say. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, somebody obviously had to shorten the press release. They only have so many column inches, you know. The unimportant stuff. Okay. Uh, let me give you a tip. If uh, you're ever invited to speak uh, at an ADC conference, uh, you don't want to be the last one. Uh, okay. <laughs> Our final speaker, and thank you very much, is Kristen Holter, who works as Assistant Operations Supervisor and Community Liaison for Rochester City Lines in Rochester, Minnesota. He is the third generation to work in the family business. He graduated from Crossroads College with a dub double major in Business Administration and Biblical Studies and Theology in 2011, and is currently finishing up a master's degree in business with an emphasis in management and strategy. He lives in Rochester with his wife, Emily, where they enjoy traveling, reading, and spending time outdoors. Thank you very much. Aha. All right. Well, good morning. Um, as, as Tom said, I am Christian Holter, and I do work for Rochester City Lines, a bus company started by my grandparents nearly 50 years ago. Today, I would like to share with you what I believe is a leading example of the struggles and successes of private transit in America. Now, before I get started, I want to thank uh, Randall O'Toole for his interest and invitation uh, to share our story this morning. So thank you very much, Randall. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Rochester City Lines was founded in 1966 after a period of no bus service in Rochester, Minnesota. The previous operator had gone bankrupt, and the city council and local chamber were searching for a new operator to step in and provide service. My grandfather, George Holter, had provided service in the, about 80 miles north in the Twin Cities area since the late 1950s, and after hearing about the opportunity and making some inquiries, he was invited and encouraged by the council and the local chamber to start service in Rochester, which was then a city of about 50,000. Holter agreed, and he spent several months developing routes by traversing city streets in the family car creating timetables and schedules with pencil and paper, and talking with citizens and businesses about how best to meet their transportation needs. Capital was outlaid for buses. Drivers were recruited, hired, and trained. A certificate of public convenience was obtained, and service commenced on Monday, August 1st of 1966. The early days were a challenge. My father remembers a story from a particularly tough Minnesota winter when those old, cold diesel engines just did not want to start. He actually, and my father actually remembers seeing my grandfather actually gathering bits of paper, string, and cardboard, and actually starting a fire underneath the engine block of one of the buses just to get enough heat to come up under the motor so that it would turn over and get started. Um, and as, thanks to that work ethic, um, he did actually get it started, and the buses ran that day. Um, and as I said, thanks to this hands-on work ethic, for a decade, uh, actually, the system was defined refined, developed, and grew along with the city. Locally, IBM had a major presence in Rochester, and Mayo Clinic was continuing to develop its world-renowned reputation for the highest quality health care available. Nationally, the landscape of public transit in America's cities began to change in the late 1960s as the Urban Mass Transportation Administration, this was later the Federal Transit Administration, was formed and began doling out grants to municipalities to preserve and improve mass transportation systems or buy out existing systems. Dozens of cities did this, but at the time, Rochester's government recognized the value of having bus service run by private industry. 1975 introduced the first change to the financing of the system, with the company agreeing to accept a small subsidy to allow seniors and the disabled to ride at a discounted rate. In 1976 and 1977, RCL and the city worked together with an outside consulting group to develop a transportation improvement plan. At a time when many cities were starting up their own transit systems or buying out the existing operators, 
one of the major recommendations of the consultants was for Rochester City Lines to have, and I quote from the report, continued private ownership and operation of the fixed route transit system. So this is in the 1970s, you know, 10 years, 15 years after there begun to be, we, we began to see the shift in, in the national landscape. In 1981, the city of Rochester began using UMTA, these were the later, the FTA, matching grants to purchase buses, which were in turn leased to Rochester city lines. In the broader national context of these programs, it is remarkable that the local match for those 11 buses which was put up entirely by the company, Rochester City Lines, with not a dime actually coming from the city for the 11 buses that they would then own. RCL made this contribution from their operating revenues a significant showing of the good faith working relationship that was in place at that time. Thanks to the hard work, dedication, and determination of RCL management and staff, the transit system continued to grow and serve the expanding city. Over time, the FTA grants were also expanded with funds used to purchase additional buses, bus shelters, and radio equipment. In the late 70s, service expanded beyond the borders of the city of Rochester with a few intercity commuter routes serving rural outlying communities, bringing commuters to their jobs in Rochester. This is a very important development in the history of our company and is one I'll get back to later. George Holter's son, Dan, took over as general manager of the company in 1980, a role he still holds today. He was awarded the Minnesota Public Transit Association's Professional of the Year Award in 1986, and in 2003, RCL was recognized as MPTA's Transit System of the Year, an award that recognizes a system outstanding in terms of cleanliness, maintenance, on-time performance, and community relations. In 2010, the FTA conducted a triennial review, an operations and funding review that municipalities agreed to submit themselves to when they accept federal funding. Following the review, the FTA raised issue as to why the city was not procuring transit service through a competitive bidding process. They additionally informed the city that if they did not competitively bid out RCL's service, they would withhold all future funding. I'll repeat that, if the city did not bid out RCL's service. Rather than provide the FTA with a simple answer that the transit system in Rochester always had been and was still privately owned, the city responded, by beginning a request for proposals process in fall 2011. Dan Holter went before the city council at a regular meeting in November of that year, asking what gave the city the right to put the service out for bid. As far as he knew, it was owned by his family. If the city owned the transit system, when was the purchase date? What was the purchase amount? Where's the sale contract? He was met with silence. RCL responded by protesting the solicitation and subsequently filing suit against the city. <clears throat> While the case began to work its way through the district court, the city carried on its procurement efforts. They issued a request for proposals that called for bidders to operate a transit system identical to the one RCL had, was running, even including copies of the routes, timetables, and other schedule information as part of the RFP packet for bidders to study and base their bids on. The RFP encouraged prospective bidders to make every effort to hire away the drivers that RCL had recruited, hired, and trained. By March, they had selected First Transit, a division of multinational corporation First Group, to take over operations in July. RCL acquired a small fleet of their own transit buses in the months leading up to the takeover. On Monday, July 2nd of 2012, First Transit began operating on the same routes and schedules using the same buses and drivers that RCL had been running the previous Friday. Despite posting a schedule for normal operations that week, 90% of the drivers failed to report for work at RCL, instead going to work for First Transit. Now, I, I do need to take a moment here and emphasize that we don't blame or have any ill feelings towards these drivers. They did what any one of us would have done. They recognized the reality of the situation and what was going on, and they went to First Transit, realizing that their jobs had a more secure future there. They went there to protect themselves and their families, <clears throat> and we continue to maintain a good relationship with many of the drivers, many of whom had worked for our family for over 20 years. We wish them nothing but the best. First Transit ran competing bus service on the streets of Rochester for one day, but on July 3rd, RCL was compelled to suspend its operations due to an inability to compete with the now federally funded First Transit which operates the city's transit system, now known as Rochester Public Transit. Overnight, we lost 70% of our business thanks to government-sponsored competition. 
And I would now have a few photos from um, that very significant day of July 2nd, 2012, when there was competition on the streets of Rochester. Uh, what we're looking at here is downtown Rochester. <clears throat> and if you see the bus in the lower uh, left-hand corner, the green and blue one, that is one of the rebranded Rochester Public Transit buses. Um, over the weekend, the, the city had some staff that were working to rebrand buses away from the red and yellow um, that, that was Rochester City Line's colors and changed it to Rochester Public Transit using uh, a rather unattractive green and blue scheme. Um, <clears throat> the, the small transit bus on the, on the right-hand side is one of the privately owned transit buses that uh, we use to, to operate our service to the best of our abilities on that day. Uh, most of the other buses in the pictures there that you see are city-owned buses. I think there's a bus at the top of the screen that's waiting to turn, make a right turn onto the street there. That is also one of the, the private transit buses that we owned. Um, here's another picture from the same day. Um, again, we see a green and blue Rochester public transit bus. The white bus in kind of the middle of the frame is one of our pictures. And both of those buses are, are scheduled to run on the same route at the same time on the same headway. So actually what you saw is as the buses leave downtown, they just trailed each other on this route all over town, eventually returning back downtown, um, competing for riders, so to speak. Um, in the afternoon here, we see a, a rather crowded city street. And uh, again, more of the same, the, the, the lower two buses here, the one next to the silver car and the one behind it are our own buses. The three, I think there might be the, the one, in, one, two, three, the fourth one in line there would be uh, also one of ours. And then two city-owned buses. There's also a couple of coach buses there. Those are used in our commuter operation, which again, I'm going to speak more on yeah, just shortly here. Um, this is a photo of uh, General Manager Dan Holter talking with a member of the media the next day, July 3rd, after we had suspended our operations. So, you might be, and hopefully are asking at this point, surely there are rules in place governing this kind of egregious and abusive use of federal money, right? And the answer is yes, there is. Under federal statute, 49 U.S. Code Section 5323A, which governs the use of FTA grants, says... Financial assistance provided under this chapter to a state or local governmental authority may be used to operate a public transportation facility or equipment in competition with or in addition to transportation service provided by an existing public transportation company only if just compensation under state or local law will be paid to the company for its franchise or property. Our lawmakers are rightly scrutinized for wasting taxpayer money. When Congress enacted these programs, they intended for funds to be used to preserve and improve existing services, not to compete with them. Safeguards like 5323 are clearly intended to prevent the duplication of existing services. What has happened in Rochester, and has happened to Rochester city lines, is clearly an abuse of government authority and a waste of millions of tax dollars. In Minnesota, the court case has reached the Minnesota Supreme Court, which agreed earlier this summer to hear the case. The American Bus Association and United Motor Coach Association, which collectively represent over 2,000 bus companies in all 50 states, and the Minnesota Association of General Contractors, have all filed amicus friend of the court briefs on RCL's behalf, testifying to the significant and far-reaching national damage that this case would have if these wrongs are not righted. Rochester City Lines is engaged in the most significant case about U.S. transit law since the 1970s and is on the front lines to protect the rights of private bus operators in the United States. Now, I do want to keep in mind the title of my presentation this morning, Struggles and Successes. <laughs> the struggles are real and have been detailed at length, but I do want to take a moment to highlight the successes of how private transit service continues to serve southeast Minnesota. RCL's commuter service was not affected by the events surrounding the transit system, as the subsidy agreements extended to local service only. Since starting with one coach bus serving one town in 1978, <clears throat> our, the commuter division has grown along with our reputation for quality, dependable service, and friendly drivers. Service today covers 40 communities surrounding Rochester and requires 32 motor coaches every morning and afternoon to provide peak hour service. System-wide, over 550,000 rides were provided in 2012. All operating and capital costs for equipment come from Fairbox Recovery, 
and routes are added and subtracted based on profit and loss from ridership and revenue generated. The system receives zero federal or state subsidies and is not regulated by any city or county body. Thank you. We cultivate relationships in each and every one of the locations we serve, working with 40 cities in 10 counties, making stops at park and ride lots, grocery stores, civic centers, local gas stations, and other locations that provide value to the rider. Uh, Mayo Clinic, excuse me. Mayo Clinic, Olmsted County, and a number of other businesses provide alternative transit reimbursement programs for employees who commute by bus. We have a true partnership with Mayo Clinic, which now employs 32,000 people at its main Rochester campus. And Rochester today is a city of 110,000. So 32,000 people work at Mayo's Rochester campus. And, that allow, and Mayo actually allows us to participate in each and every one of their new employee orientation sessions to educate and recruit new riders. They are a strong supporter of the private transit service that we provide. In addition to our commuter division, we also offer chartered motor coach services to increase the revenue production of our fleet. We serve schools, colleges and universities, civic groups, and other corporate clients. We are a member of the International Motor Coach Group, an exclusive industry network of companies in the U.S. and Canada who are committed to the highest standards of safety, maintenance, customer service, and overall excellence. In summary, Despite the current challenges, Rochester City Lines remains a real-life example with nearly five decades of history demonstrating that the free market delivers quality transportation that is efficient, reliable, and customer-oriented. I invite you to find us on Facebook or speak with my father, who's here today, or myself, for ways to keep up uh, about our court battle. Thank you.